Uh, Chair, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I have to say it's an honor and a privilege and a delight uh, to be in front of you this morning at this first uh, FIT New South Wales conference and also as harbinger of the uh, Walk 21 conference that's coming to, uh, to Sydney and the state of New South Wales uh, later this year. Um, I've got a couple of apologies to make uh, to start with. One is, as you can hear already, I have a husky voice as a result of losing it totally last week, which when you're on a 10-week speaking tour in your second week is not a particularly good thing to happen. So my apologies if, I'm, uh, if I am a little husky. Um, the second apology is that although I am a UK citizen and have lived there much of my life, I'm now a, a very recent American resident, um, resident in what after the winter we've just had people are calling the United States of Antarctica. Um, <laughs> And as such, of course, I am utterly unqualified to talk about cricket. Uh, much, I might say, as would be the England cricket team, but there we go. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity of, uh, uh, of, of bringing together, I guess, that show of hands that we saw earlier on from different sectors of government and different uh, interests. And we're all here today to share a common interest in, in, in this conference. And I would like to argue to you at the start of today that walking really sits at the heart of what everybody in this room uh, needs to be doing. So my uh, approach over the next uh, 35, 40 minutes will be to look at some benefits and barriers to walking, which many of us will know, to look at the case for walking, which is what this segment of the conference is about under three particular headings, health, the economic case and the demographic case, to look quickly at some policy and practical responses from various communities uh, around the world, um, and then finally to look at uh, a future agenda for uh, challenges and opportunities. So please forgive me uh, while I indulge myself to start with by just trying to flag up the, uh, the, the key benefits of, of walking. And everybody in the room knows these, but I, I think sometimes we don't really put them together as a really uh, uh, um, impressive package. Of course, walking is an inclusive uh, activity. And I note the reference to cycling earlier on, and, and Chris, I know, is a cyclist, and many in the room are cyclists, and so am I. So please don't think this is in any way an anti-cycling message. But the point is that cycling is still a minority activity. Uh, whereas walking is not. Everybody walks. And so when you stand in front of your politicians looking for resources, you can say this isn't a special interest group. This is something for the entire community. Uh, and of course, within that, we're including children, because walking is the first thing we want to do as a child, and right through into uh, uh, seniority, because walking is the last thing we want to give up as an adult. Um, so this is an all-inclusive activity which covers all members of the population across all economic uh, and ethnic sectors. Secondly, it's an issue of community cohesion because we know the communities that work well are the ones where neighbours can greet and talk and chat in public space directly face to face. Um, and that community cohesion will bring people out of their houses, will avoid long-term isolation and the, the healthcare costs that come from that. It increases our personal security because all of us know the safe streets are the streets with lots of people in them and the scary ones are the empty ones. So the more we walk as individuals, the more we make it for safe for other people to walk as well. There is, in other words, uh, safety in, in numbers. Fourthly, we know that it brings freedom for our children. All of our surveys show that our children want to play outside more. They want to walk and run more. Uh, but unfortunately, we prevent them from doing so in large de degree because of our twin fears of uh, traffic danger and uh, stranger, so-called stranger danger. And as a result, we've withdrawn them really from many uh, sim simple daily activities such as walking or cycling to school, which in the past brought them many uh, health benefits. Fifthly, uh, is the issue of public transport. And I know here in Sydney you're in embarking on a new heavy rail uh, expansion, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that as that takes place, you will make sure that your stations and your stops are places to which people can walk in comfort and security with a sense of, uh, of welcoming to those places. And we need to recognize that every passenger on your new public transport system will be a walker at the start of the journey and a walker at the end of the journey. And indeed, we need to think of those people on those vehicles as actually having a temp temporary sitting down interlude between two walk trips. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we do that, I think we'll recognize that that 
half mile or 800 meter walking uh, circle, if you like, around your stops and stations needs to be addressed really very seriously. It's not just a case of fixing up the precinct around the station. It's a question of making the, the whole journey from, uh, from your front door to the station and then on to your destination uh, a safe and attractive walking experience. And then finally is the issue of road safety. <clears throat> we have uh, an, an apparently counterintuitive uh, situation where if you want more road safety for all road users, including car drivers, the response really is to increase the number of people on foot in public space. Because the more walkers there are, the more, the benign, the more benign the road environment becomes, uh, the more traffic slows down, and as a consequence, it is safer for all road users, walkers, cyclists, public transport, and indeed car drivers. And so that's a fairly impressive package of, uh, of benefits uh, for, for walking, which I think sometimes we don't uh, really emphasize strongly enough. So one could make a case for walking amongst any of those that, that, that list there, and indeed many more, but I've chosen today just to focus on three, just to bring out the ones I think will appeal most to, to members uh, of the audience and their experience and, and, and daily work activities. So we'll look at health, we'll look at economics, and we'll look at the demographic case uh, one by one. First of all, in terms of health, I've been a bit naughty here because I've borrowed this, these slides from a practicing U.S. physician by the name of Robert Salis, who practices um, in California as a family physician. And uh, he presented at a conference in Washington in, in October, and I borrowed these slides from him afterwards because I think coming from a physician's mouth uh, about the benefits of walking, it's much more powerful than coming from mine. So I make no apology. I'm simply repeating his words for you today. Um, and what he was lamenting was the fact that as a physician in the United States, he has to refer all the time to this blue book, the physician's desk reference. And so when he has a patient in front of him asking for something to make him or her well, his normal response is to turn to the physician's reference book and look at uh, the symptoms and the side of, and, and, and so on, and look at the kind of drug he's going to recommend for them uh, and, and consult over side effects and dosages, etc. So... He just speculated on what the entry would be in the U.S. Physician's Reference Manual if he could write the pages for walking. And so this is what he, he said. The generic name is physical activity, other brand names, you can, you can see what they are there. Dosage, 150 minutes a week. In adults, 60 minutes uh, for, for children. Pregnancy and lactation, completely safe, good for mother and baby. So that's, that's a pretty good start. Indications and usage. Well, decreased premature death, all cause and cardiovascular, reduced development, improved management of diabetes, lower risk of cancer, hypertension, depression, anxiety, da 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 da. A tremendous list of benefits that will come from uh, prescribing this, this drug. Um, the side effects, always there are side effects to drugs. Well, look at these decreased blood pressure, pulse and alcohol, <laughs> blood sugar, stronger muscles and bones, weight loss, improved mood, confidence, self-esteem, concentration, bowel and sleep habits improved, look and feel better. Wow, what a list of side effects. Um, adverse reactions, sweating, injury through overdose and sudden death is extremely rare. Um, he pointed out that you can do this, uh, administer this drug on your own in the you know, comfort of your own home, or it could actually be a group drug-taking activity, uh, <laughs> which I think is a nice thought too. Um, and he ended by saying that walking is the long-sought vaccine to prevent chronic disease and extend life. Um, and pictures a, a running shoe, a walking shoe inside a, 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 a capsule uh, jar and says if we had a pill that conferred the proven health benefits of walking, physicians would prescribe it to every patient and healthcare systems would find a way to make sure every patient had access to this wonder drug. Well, that's really powerful stuff. And he ended uh, with, a, with a really nice summary, I think, of, the, uh, uh, of why we should choose this as the default exercise prescription. Now, of course, you know, swimming and, 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 and running and so on are, are also, and gym work are tremendously beneficial. But walking sits at the heart of what we're trying to encourage people to do because of these things, because it's accessible, because it's low cost, because it's measurable, uh, because it is the most common act uh, adult activity because it's proven and because it's cost saving. So for all of those reasons, walking is the most important thing that we should be doing from a health, health perspective to encourage physical activity. So 
If that's the health case, what about the economic case? Is this something that we really should be doing in order to uh, support our economic activity? Well, a, a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to be asked by the Heart Foundation of South Australia to summarise the evidence from around the world uh, uh, in answer to this question. Does a walking and cycling friendly Main Street provide retail and economic benefits? And uh, the, the results, are, the, the report is published, it's on the Heart Foundation website if you want to go and look at it. It's being used as a calling card really for local business improvement associations and retailers to, uh, to, to try to cut through some of the myths surrounding parking in particular um, and the way we need to be designing and using our main streets, main shopping strips and so on in, uh, in Australia. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details of that report, you can read it for yourself, but the conclusions were really very, very uh, straightforward. This wasn't original research, it was just simply a synthesis of, of what exists uh, already around the world. And the main conclusion, I think, is that walk-in expenditure in main streets is always more than we think it is. Whenever we do the surveys, we always find that people on foot spend much more than we expect. And the reason is that although they spend less per visit than people in cars, because they can carry less, they visit much more often. And so the total expenditure from people who arrive on foot is actually much greater and of much greater benefit to uh, retail environments than those arriving by, by vehicle. Um, and the report shows very clearly that if we have more walking, it will increase rents, property prices, business and the local economy. And the conclusion from that is that in those streets, space for people is more important than uh, space for car parking. And that really does get at the heart of one of the debates one constantly has in uh, Main Street Australia about the value of that car park space immediately outside the shop to the shop owner. Um, and it was very difficult, in fact impossible, to find evidence from anywhere in the world that using that space for car parking was in any way beneficial by comparison with using it as space for people to linger, to talk, to window shop, to chat, to meet their friends, uh, to sojourn in the European word, to loiter even. Uh, we want people using that space in that way, finding time then to sit down and rest and recover their resources and then get up and go spending again. So local businesses, the report argues, benefit most actually from reducing traffic speeds uh, and widening footpaths and from making the street more attractive for people to spend their time and indeed spend their money. Um, and so the overall view con concurs with what intuitively I think we've known for many years but we're now getting the measurable evidence to support this which is that walking is a precondition for an economically healthy city. Specifically that a good walking environment is a good economic environment. And as an ex-academic, I'd been looking for years for somebody to come up with a heap of money to support a research project to demonstrate the truth of the next statement, which I'm sure is true, but I've never had the opportunity to prove it, which is that the slower we travel, the more we spend. Uh, so that what we need to be doing in our high streets is putting as much friction in there as possible to slow people down, shake the money out of their trouser pockets and handbags into the local community rather than have it sped through into some distant place. Now that has a number of ramifications and I know there are people in the room interested in food issues so I thought I'd just you know, throw in a, a, an example of the negative and the positive things about walking related to, to food. We, we're aware of the issue of uh, suburbanization of supermarkets, which is part of the trend that's led towards uh, areas of the city in which it's very difficult to get uh, 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 healthy foods. Uh, we call them food deserts, as we know. Um, and not only are many parts of those uh, cities uh, areas where supermarkets are thin on the ground and healthy food is thin on the ground, even if it's available, very often it's very difficult to get to. So this is the walking element. All right, there might be a supermarket there, but can you actually get to it on foot and carry your groceries home in, in light of these kinds of barriers that we see uh, for, for people uh, shopping on foot? And it came to mind when a couple of years ago I was in New Zealand uh, and I saw a brand new supermarket uh, in a small west coast town um, which apparently had no access to it on foot at all. It was surrounded by car parking. And uh, so intrigued because I know that pedestrians are really uh, uh, quite a, an, an enterprising bunch. They'd find a way to get there somehow. So I thought, well, where is the, the, the access on foot? So I patrolled around the outside of the supermarket and I found it. There it is. Uh, it's a kind of goat track that goes up the hill through the bushes at the back of the car park. 
uh, walk up that hill and at the top you find they've, they've smashed their way through the <laughs> chicken wire fencing in order to get their groceries home. And it gets better because this is a wet country and that is a slippery slope. So somebody has tied a rope to the pole at the top and now, now you can actually sort of abseil to the shops. Uh, <clears throat> Now, of course, the lovely thing about this is you're actually getting physical activity as part of your shopping experience, but it's not really what anybody would recommend. And, I, you know, you wonder how hard we have to make it uh, for people to do the right thing and to shop uh, on, on foot. So there's a lot of negative things about access to food when it comes to walking, but happily there are a lot of positive things happening now, and including here in, in Sydney. Um, the food truck movement began in, in Los Angeles in... Uh, uh, in 2008, and I love this description of it. Hip vendors serving up gourmet comfort food for budget-conscious customers drawn in droves by Twitter feeds and Facebook updates. What a wonderful description that is. Um, by the summer of 11, food trucks were appearing all over uh, North America, and uh, there were two kind of responses. There were the, you know, the rather dull bureaucratic responses from places like uh, Montreal and Toronto, which just simply produced a blizzard of bureaucratic reasons why this shouldn't be happening. And there were those that were more progressive, like Vancouver, for example, that simply welcomed them. And now Vancouver has an extraordinary uh, 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 movement of food trucks and carts. And I'm delighted to say that Sydney does also. Your Street Fest food trucks united at Belmore Park on... Uh, uh, on some Fridays is creating a, a, a walkable nighttime economy in a part of the city which might not have been so welcoming after hours beforehand. So I think, you know, that the, the economic message uh, is pretty clear in terms of traditional main streets and we're also seeing some rather more unusual es esoteric twists on that message when it comes to, to access to food and walking as well. But it's not just about uh, shopping. Uh, there are other extraordinary benefits that are appearing now from the walking revolution that's taking place in, in cities around the world. And many of you in the room will be familiar with this, uh, this term, walk score. This is a US uh, uh, web site uh, which actually calculates the walkability of any address you put into the algorithm. It's available here in Australia. Go home tonight. Please, not now, but go home tonight and check it out. Put in your home address and find out the walk score for your home address. And it will be somewhere between zero, which is a disaster, and 100, which is paradise. And what is interesting about this photograph from Fran San Francisco is that a realtor here renting a downtown office has not bothered to tell us that this has great views or nice rooms or good suites or hardwood floors or whatever. Instead, they've elected to tell us that it scores 100 on walk score. Now, that's really very interesting that a realtor feels that this is the most important selling value for that particular property. And the evidence is now accumulating across the United States, for example. Uh, every extra walk score point on your house in the United States will add somewhere between $700 and $3,000 to its, its value. And that's been picked up strongly by the realtor industry. 30,000 American realtors now link into walk score uh, as a way of selling properties. So some, something's, happen, something's afoot, if you'll, uh, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, something's happening here where the real estate industry is twigging the fact that walkability sells. It has a value. Um, and I don't think we can get any better example of how important walking is becoming to the modern city economy when we're realizing that places that are walkable are more valuable than places that are not. So the economic values, I think, are, are, are pretty clear there. Lastly, let me just look quickly at a couple of demographic uh, e examples um, of cases for walking. We've looked at a health case, we've looked at an economic case. What, is there a demographic case that's emerging as well? And I think one could argue this in two strands. One is the seniors, the boomers. Boomers are becoming seniors. The, the leading edge of the boomers is now emerging into seniority. And then secondly, I'll look at Gen Ys at the other end of the scale in, in a moment. <clears throat> but you know the story about ageing Australia. Um, the 65-year-olds uh, and up will double by 2050, and 85-year-olds will quadruple during that period. And that means that as the, this huge boomer generation moves through into seniority, they will take up walking uh, in very large numbers. Uh, increasingly, they'll give up the, the really hard physical activity, such as perhaps running and take up walking instead. So it'll be a voluntary thing. Uh, those who are inactive will realize with the grim reaper coming over the horizon 
they better start getting active. And I've seen a study, by the way, that argues that the Grim Reaper walks at five kilometers an hour. Anybody who walks slower than that is in danger of being overtaken. So <laughs> just watch out for that one. Um, but they'll also be doing it involuntarily as well, as seniors uh, begin to not want to drive anymore, feel less confident, lose their licenses and so on. So increasingly, for voluntary and involuntary reasons, our seniors will want to be living in more walkable places. And we as a society uh, should be supporting in them in that, because if they can walk, they are not going to be homebound with all of the attendant costs that come from, from that. So at the one end of the scale, I think there's an argument for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, uh, for walking as far as seniors are concerned. The goal really, and again, I borrowed this slide, but I do like it, um, it's about functional capacity and maintaining that as much as we can through age. And if we're smokers and non-walkers, this might be our kind of curve. Um, leading to a, an area we might call deficient survival here, where you know, you're alive, but it ain't much fun uh, because your functional capacity has declined so much. So what we want is non-smoking walkers who stay alive to the last day and then fall off the cliff. Uh, and, and as Aldous Huxley beautifully put it, the goal is to die young, but as late as possible. <laughs> um, and I think walking should, uh, should help us in, in that goal. OK. Uh, one of the key issues here is, is about walking speed. And um, we have a problem, I think, in many cities of uh, the developed world that we set our traffic lights at 1.2 meters per second. And increasingly, as we age, we can't walk that fast. Um, and in my uh, home country, in the UK, we've got this completely wrong. And we're going to have to re uh, 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 readdress this in the future. So when people have pressed the button and they're crossing the road, for the, you know, the middle age group in the middle here, fine, you know, keep on walking. But for the elderly people at the front here, hurry up. And for the elderly people at the back, don't even start because you're not going to make it. And we've had celebrated cases in the US recently where elderly people trying to cross the road have not made it to the other side before the green, before the red walking symbol appears. And they've actually been arrested for obstructing the traffic. Um, so clearly we have a problem as we, as we uh, go into uh, seniority. And while I was researching that, by the way, I, this is completely irrelevant, but I thought you, you might want to share this. I found this, uh, an American uh, research on, on the pedestrian equivalent of road rage. Uh, so I thought I'd just share this with you. Uh, do you feel that you are not yielding when it's the polite thing to do? You are bumping into others? Are you feeling competitive with other pedestrians? Uh, do you have denigrating thoughts about them? Do you mutter about them? Do you feel enraged at other pedestrians and enjoy thoughts of violence? Uh, do you actually experience IED, intermittent explosive disorder? Um, if so, you're experiencing pedestrian aggressiveness syndrome. Um, but there's a home for you. I found a Facebook page which is perfect. It's actually called, I secretly want to punch slow walking pedestrians in the back of the head. <coughs> and amazingly, <coughs> excuse me, there are 30,000 members already. <laughs> okay, so what about the other end of the demographic push here? Um, Gen Ys are, dis are displaying quite remarkably different transport behavior from previous generations. This is the 20 to the 35 year old uh, or ish band of people. Um, we started to notice this around the turn of the century. Now it's a very clear trend that the Gen Y cohort uh, mileage is falling in the US very, very sharply. It's down by a quarter already. <laughs> it's diverging very sharply more from, uh, from existing driving habits, as you can see from the numbers there. It's reflected in license holding, as American youth defers getting a license till later in life, and indeed, in many cases, doesn't get a license at all. Um, and is reflected in public <coughs> transport use, um, where they uh, outperform their cohort numbers in terms of public transport ridership. So what seems to be happening is, it, is Gen Ys are moving into big cities, sorry, moving into cities, not just big cities, uh, living in places where they can triangulate between public transport for daily use, um, walking and cycling for their local movement, and car share or car hire for the times when they do need a car. And no part of that picture involves owning a car or parking it anywhere. <clears throat> so this is really something we picked up a few years ago, but it does seem to be accelerating. Um, and one then starts to speculate on the reasons why. And I don't know what the reasons are, but I did pick this up 
This is retaliation by the, U by the US motor industry, an advert from a General Motors car uh, with a picture of a bus with photoshopped as a destination board, creeps and weirdos, uh, trying to sell the, the notion of the bus as loser cruiser. Uh, that, that uh, millennials or Gen Ys really shouldn't be, be seen on board. So, you know, this is now a, a, a real phenomenon. So if we ask ourselves why this is happening, I think a whole bunch of issues will come up. We'd probably get hundreds if we threw this open to discussion in the room. But insurance is more expensive, licenses are more expensive to drive, living at home longer, uh, more people <coughs> living in the inner city, that for sure is, is, is happening. Uh, cultural factors, the car, the car is no more a status symbol to Gen Ys than a dishwasher is. Uh, it's, it's lost that value that it had for previous generations. Some environmental concerns, but I would offer to you, I suspect the key reasons are a whole bunch of social, uh, sorry, new technology issues. Um, staying in touch with social media, um, being so much more savvy at using public transport apps uh, for real-time information to be able to catch buses and and, uh, and, and light rail and so on, more easily than previous generations. And probably the cri critical one is texting. <coughs> and uh, living in the US as I do now, I see these public information campaigns, just as a generation ago it was don't drink and drive, now it's don't text and drive. Mm -hmm. And the underlying philosophy here seems to be, you know, you shouldn't do these two things together, so you've got to give one of them up. And the implication of all of the advertisements <laughs> is that you should give up texting. But what I think Gen Ys are saying is actually no. We think texting is more important than driving. So we are going to go and live in parts of the city where we can ride public transport and walk and continue texting as we have done before. Now, that's speculation. I have no evidence for that. But I suspect that it's a combination of those reasons with, with texting being a key one. OK, so <clears throat> given if that's the case for walking, what kind of responses do we see uh, uh, around the world at, at various scales. And this is going to be very much a, you know, a quick overview, a, 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 a scan through the menu, if you like, of what cities are doing. And we are at a remarkable stage because so much is now happening in, in city after city. And much of this is at local level because lo you know, walking is fundamentally a local activity. And so I, I just started listing here the things that I was aware of that cities are, you know, are, are doing. And, You'll be familiar with many of these in, 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 in Toronto and, and, and Faria. They've been removing major freeways. The, Paris, uh, the Pompidou Expressway in Paris has been turned into a beach. Um, American uh, uh, cities are producing complete streets in large numbers. Um, flexible streets have now appeared on the horizon so that streets can be changed according to time of day or indeed season. Uh, shared streets, we'll see in a moment. Open streets, the idea of turning your streets into places without cars but full of people and other activities, as in Bogota and many, many cities around the world, summer Sundays, that kind of thing. Uh, plazas, intersection repairs, parklets, pop up this, pop up that, pop up everything, uh, you know, appearing in, in cities everywhere. Guerrilla wayfinding, behavior change programs, and so on. Um, and, you know, just by way of a quick flip through some of these, here's a, you know, a, a, an Australasian example of shared space taking place now in, in Auckland, in New Zealand. Um, this is the initial evaluation of shared space uh, in two or three uh, environments. And you can see the numbers yourself here in terms of retail spend between pre and post shared space construction. It's up by 20%. And the hospitality spend, you know, your coffee and your restaurants, up five, more than fivefold in a two year period. So simply creating a shared space where people mix with bikes and public transport and cars and on foot creates a congenial environment in which clearly people want to spend time and, and money. Um, the flexible streets I've mentioned also in Toronto, this is an example uh, of, of, of those and I'm going to flick through these very quickly. The plazas and turning streets into different kinds of environments. The New York case of course is famous and, and, and Karen Lee earlier I think referred to that that several blocks of the, one of the most famous streets in the world, Broadway, have now effectively been decommissioned as a road and turned into public plazas. Um, and it started as a demonstration project. And as Jeanette Sadiq Khan, the traffic, ex-traffic commissioner, uh, says, you can change your city in close to real time. If it doesn't work, you can put it back. And that alleviates the sense of anxiety that people feel about change. And intersection repair programs, famously in Portland, where it started as a community intervention, where people were fed up 
with the traffic in their neighbourhoods and simply went out and painted the intersections to slow traffic down has now been adopted as a city ordinance and the city itself has intersection repair as a policy to support people to calm their own neighbourhoods. And what this is, is effectively embraced in this term tactical urbanism, which we're seeing uh, appear in city after city across the world. And it's, I suppose, in, typified by parklets. The idea of taking out a couple of car parking spots, putting in a, a wooden bench to replace them, and allow human life to spill out onto them. And people appear as in Star Trek. It's quite extraordinary. <laughs> take, the, take the car spaces away, give it to people, and, and parklets uh, will, will generate activity. There are thousands of these in, in, in cities across the world. And they've become really the sort of forerunner of this tactical urbanism phrase coined by Mike Leiden uh, in Canada in, in 2011, a deliberate phased approach to instigating change, local in scale, short term in duration, and low in risk. But if successful, it suggests the possibility of something uh, larger and more long lasting. Well, that's very much local scale in terms of infrastructure, but local scale is there in terms of behaviour change programmes, no, no better illustrated than I think in the uh, children's activities we're seeing in city after city, where we're uh, uh, auditing uh, environments around schools and saying, you know, if it's, uh, if it's not safe, make it safe, and if it is safe, get kids walking and biking. So it's infra infrastructure change is important, but the behaviour change programmes lock in the benefits of those infrastructure improvements. And I thought this was a really nice example of behaviour change. Came across this very recently in Moscow. Instead of buying a subway ticket, you can do 30 squats. <laughs> I'd like to see that in car parks instead. <laughs> okay, so that's very much at the local scale, which is at the forefront of this. The uh, provincial level, the state level, is also joining in with, with many developments. And in Australia now, we also see uh, level at the, at the work at the federal level also. Um, with uh, guidance on walking, riding and act, act, access to public transport coming up last year and also potentially a very significant change in the thinking of, uh, of Austroads. Um, they effectively published this report last year which is a mea culpa saying that actually we've had this wrong for many years. Our guidance to traffic engineers has been too pro-car and has ignored pedestrians and that has to change. And so this new guidance there will be filtering into decisions made about road space in Australia in, in years to come, which is really exciting. And so what about at the international level? Well, as I mentioned, there is uh, the Walk 21 conference is coming. Um, Walk 21 is this international not-for-profit which has been involved around the world for a number of years now. And one of the things we do is work with communities who sign the International Charter for Walking as a way of... Uh, um, confirming with their, their, their constituencies that uh, they want to be a walkable or walk-friendly community. But most of all, of interest to this audience, I guess, is the Walk 21 uh, conference series, which started in London in 2000 and is now coming to, to Sydney uh, this year. What I think is interesting here is that the, the 20th century in 100 years did not have a single international walking conference. We had an experimental one in 2000 and we haven't stopped since because there is demand for this to be happening around the world. And so, <clears throat> um, there's the, uh, the information that you need, and Peter McHugh from PCAL made sure I put the, 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 uh, the, the statement at the bottom, uh, abstract submission by March 14th, no extensions. So, if you're intending to get one in, you need to get one out, get out there and start writing soon. Uh, just by way of other new things happening this year, the new conference is arriving. I thought I'd show you some new shoes from where I'm living now. Uh, this is what you need to get around in New York. Um, and, and I thought you'd like to see these as well. These are new shoes with GPS built in, uh, so you can program them to take you home. Uh, and they struck me as being ideal for King's Cross at 3 o'clock on a Friday night. Um, you know, get your last four drinks in and then say to your shoes, off we go. But I think these are really ideal for Australians. You're so itinerant, you move so much, you travel so much, that here is a new set of Australian shoes with a home built in where you can actually take your <laughs> tent with you whenever you go. So there you go, that's the latest fashion brief in terms of walking. walking. But uh, the serious business is the conference is coming to you. Um, and it's had all kinds of implications and outcomes uh, in, in terms of knowledge and relationships uh, as it's passed around the world in recent years. And it's your opportunity, I guess, to seize this conference and 
use it as part of a step change, so to speak, in, uh, in walking in, uh, in New South Wales and, and in Sydney. Um, so in all sorts of ways, we've engaged with uh, polit the political level and the professional level and the advocacy level uh, to bring walking really into the forefront of, uh, of various communities. So a wonderful opportunity, I think, for you to build on that uh, this year. So my message is that we are in an extraordinary moment. Um, the change in the last uh, 14 years is, is, is extraordinary. Um, as I think I've said to some groups before, I, I remember standing in front of uh, councils 15 years ago and being introduced to somebody who's going to talk about walking, and you could see the councillors' eyes roll into the back of their heads, you know, um, and they were peering under the chairs to see if I was wearing sandals and, and got any tofu with me. Um, you know, I mean, this was just seen as something that was, you know, lefty and radical and not really you know, something that council should conserve concern itself with. But now, of course, it's mainstream. I mean, I haven't said anything today that isn't absolutely core business for what cities around the world are doing. So that journey over 15 years has been quite extraordinary in terms of professional skills, political understanding, and public awareness as well. Still some things to do. Uh, and I just, just offer two of them to you here, one at the macro scale and one at the, at the local scale, where so many of us work. At the macro scale, we have to get to grips with this issue of peak car. And I'm not mistaking peak oil for peak car. Peak car is a further phenomenon which began to emerge at around the turn of the, of the century, where we're seeing, first of all, a flatlining in driving in uh, mature economies, and since then, a steady fall. And this applies, first of all, to the US and North America, but it certainly applies also to Australia and to Europe. This is right across those mature big economies. Driving is down, license holding is down, um, and there's evidence here, for example, from Sydney and from London, uh, about the effect that it's, that it's having. So we need to respond to that. I mean, I think we've been waiting for a few years to see if it's real. Now we know it's real. The question next is, what do you do about that? How do you build that into your future plans and, and programs? And this phrase has now appeared from research published in the US late last year, the driving boom is over. Uh, a six decade long period of steady increases in per capita driving is over. The unique combination of conditions fueled by the driving, fueled the driving boom, cheap gas, <laughs> rapid expansion of the workforce during the baby boom generation no longer exists. Now, if, if that is happening, and if that is spreading, as one thinks it is to Australia, then the questions that confront us are, are, are these. Do we continue to plan for certainty into the future, more parking, more roads, more driving, as we've done for the last 50 or 60 years, or do we now say, hang on a minute, the evidence is no longer there that we should support those kinds of approaches. So maybe we need to be a little more humble to start planning for uncertainty into the future because we don't really know where these lines are taking us. We need to support the millennials, the Gen Ys, in their demonstrable wish to drive less, to live in places where they can drive less and use public transport, walking, and car share as a way to get around. If we've got plans for new or expanded highways, we need to think carefully about whether it's time to revisit those. And then lastly, to remove barriers that we have to people walking and cycling, the non-driving uh, options. And the evidence, I think, is accumulating all the time um, and this is a, is a research project from last year, which uh, come two years ago, compares the three US cities with the most parking on your left, and the three cities with the least parking on the right. And on your left, you can see in these three cities with the most parking, uh, driving has gone up, commuting by car has gone up, jobs have gone down, and medium income has gone down. In the three US cities with the least parking, uh, driving is flatlining, commuting by car is flatlining, jobs sharply up, median income off the scale. Uh, so the evidence seems to be with us now that more walking and less driving is the direction that we need to go for economic health. And of course it's not just about the city centres, it's about the peripheries as well in which we've planned walking out of the environment in so many places and, and ways. And we need to revisit those places to make sure that we're, our new walking 
uh, uh, posh is not just about gentrified inner cities, but it's about those other places where people can't get to shops, can't get to the pharmacy, can't get to the doctor on a daily basis. <coughs> and we need to be reimagining those landscapes using the five Ds uh, in order to, uh, to make walking more possible for them. And so, if that's the macro level stuff, the action at the local level, I'm just putting five, feet, five things out there for you to, uh, um, to, to, to maybe, as a palette, of things that you might want to take on board. Number one, stick with the evidence on the parking issue from uh, uh, what's emerging around the world is that space for people is more important than car parking. And if somebody argues the opposite, then it's incumbent on us to ask the question, show us. Show us the evidence that more car parking will bring more economic benefit. Secondly, we need to make sure we've got resourcing for this to happen. And the good news is that resourcing for active travel, walking and cycling is fantastically good value for money. 13 to 1 as a cost-benefit ratio across the world in a study done in the UK a couple of years ago. Thirdly, Build your behavior change programs. It's not just about pouring concrete and making environments walkable. It's about locking in those benefits by building in behavior change programs which allow people to think about using those uh, new facilities. Fourthly, it's about demonstration projects. The, the tactical urbanism that we're seeing happening in place after place, the New York experience, it's all about thinking about quick, cheap, uh, interesting changes, experimenting, see if they work and if they don't work, take them out and move them somewhere else or think of something else, rather than going through necessarily long gestation periods of, of change. That might be necessary for big projects, but start to think in terms of small-scale tactical intervention at the local level. And then finally, realize that we're all friends in this room. What, whatever, we put our, whatever question we raised our hand to earlier on, we're all looking for the same uh, outcome to deliver our goals in our particular sphere. So it's about partnerships. It's about walkability really lying at the heart of all of these things that we're trying to uh, deliver as, uh, as local government and, and, and state government. So I, I think that's a useful one to bear in mind. You are going to have to do more and more in the way of partnership, hand-holding, sharing with others. Uh, the Hart Foundation, I think, put that very nicely when it said that uh, walking is very much a whole of government issue. Um, and for the cynics amongst you, if you're not really sure about what partnership involves, I'll offer you a workable definition. It's suppression of mutual loathing in pursuit of a grant. <laughs> so, so maybe you need to be thinking along those lines uh, as we go forward. And my last slide is simply a question to you. you know, what kind of place do you want to live in into the future? What kind of place do you want your children to live in? Uh, these are choices. These are two Australian scenes, both of which you can choose, uh, but they will be the outcomes of the decisions that you make. And the one on the top left, of course, has as many people in it, um, but they're all canned. They're all in cars. Uh, there are no fresh people here at all, whereas this one has got lots of fresh people. Um, and also important is they're on their feet. They're walkers. And for me, that's absolutely critical because... Uh, walkers are the indicator species for quality of life in our cities. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, well, thank you very much, Rodney. That was a fantastic presentation and really sums up some of the, the values and benefits of walking and creating an environment that supports that. So we're exactly on time, um, and so we have about 20 minutes or so for uh, question and answers. So um, we've got one straight there, so we'll jump right into the question. Did you really take questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, G'day, Roddy. Paul Clarenar from Northern Sydney Health. Uh, thanks very much. That's inspiring as always. Um, just a question about what you said, the future of these suburban shopping malls, that, that image you showed at the end. Um, people arrive by car, they sort of have to, but once they're inside, there is a lot of walking and that slow pedestrian traffic, which is obviously a robust, seems like a good retail model and does generate a lot of economic activity. Um, so, what are the pros and cons, and what's the future or alternative to that sort of model? Well, of course, many <laughs> people do indeed enjoy that shopping experience, but it is only that. It's a shopping experience, it's not a town centre experience, and there's, there's, there's a difference between the, those. Um, and many, of course, do drive to them, and many have no alternative but to drive to them. And uh, we p probably need to recognize that that is going to continue for, for, for now, for those existing centers. 
but there's certainly an opportunity to make walking within those centres much more attractive than it is. Um, one sees people driving from shop to shop within them, for example, because the walking environment within those, those, those centres is so poor. Um, so the, the acres of bitumen and asphalt with no walking opportunities, nothing of any interest, actually simply encourages more and more car use and less and less walking within them. So I think there's an opportunity to, to address that at, at those kinds of scales. But what I see happening is that many of those large centres are no longer doing as well as they used to uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And possibly some of that is internet shopping anyway. So that what people are perhaps looking for when they go out is not so much just simply to purchase some goods, but to have some sort of experience, which possibly is not being offered by those kinds of environments anymore. So by, by maybe going for different kinds of spaces, smaller places, more close to where people live, you can provide a different kind of shopping uh, experience, a, a, a public in experience for people. Um, but it's, it's not easy. I mean, nobody's saying that easy. You know, the, I, I meet people who say, well, that's in the too hard bucket. You know, just let's, let's keep working on our city centres and, and maybe this will all come right out there in the end. I don't think that's appropriate. I really do think we have to think creatively about how to reimagine those suburbs, how to turn some of those shopping centres around to face the street, um, how we can re, uh, redesign shop fronts to make them into places where people want to stroll and spend time, which is not what they are at the moment. Uh, they're very functional. You drive there, you shop, and then you drive home again. And there's no community feel, no experience that you have that you would have had in a traditional shopping street. So we need to find ways of working our way back towards that. But as I say, that's not, not an easy, easy answer. Okay, no, thank you. Um, we've got a question at the back there. Alex Arnwin from Bicycle New South Wales. Um, thank you, Rodney, for a, a fantastic presentation. Um, uh, I think that your closing piece around partnerships, I think, was really, really useful and, and, and helpful in orienting the room to the kind of way that we want to approach this. And I guess that and what comes out of that is the importance of recognising that kind of we're all in this together. Um, well, th well, thank you for that question, and, and thanks for the opportunity to redeem myself. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I maybe was being a little flippant to start with. I certainly didn't mean to imply that, that cyclists were any you know, special interest group who, uh, uh, who were calling for special treatment. But uh, I think it's fair to say that over the years in Australia, cyclists have, uh, have been conspicuous. They've been vocal. They've been articulate, they've been very helpful, they're part of the decision-making structure, they're, they're on, uh, on our plans in, into the future. Um, what I guess I'm getting at is that there seems to be a misapprehension that there's a new mode out there called walking and cycling. Um, and that as long as we continue to write walking and cycling into our plans, somehow it will all turn out right in the end. Well. I fear that if we do that, what actually happens in the end is that we get cycling and we don't get any walking. Um, and of course the two modes do share a huge amount in common, but they also have differences, quite, quite substantial differences. And I guess what I'm trying to do is to rebalance what we've been doing for the last 20 years and saying to the cyclists, well done, great, you've made yourself heard, 
it's appearing in the streets, we're seeing a change in public mood that cyclists are now an accepted part of the traffic mix. But that hasn't yet happened for walking in many cities. So I, I guess I'm pushing very hard in, in that direction to get walking as part of that. I wouldn't want to share any details of exactly how things changed in, in, in Copenhagen because every city is different. But I think this kind of gathering is part of that process and Walk 21 will be part of that process and indeed fit New South Wales going forward if it has walking and cycling as separate but kindred modes at its forefront that will be I think a start of that long journey. I'm not aware of any studies particularly on Gen Ys and how far they're prepared to walk compared to other, uh, other demographic groups. Um, one could say that in some cases it's probably as far uh, as they can walk before they collide with a post as a result of staring down at the screen. Um, but that, but that I know some communities in London are now looking at cladding some of their, their poles with, uh, with, with, with uh, material that will prevent head injuries. Um, but apart from being flippant about it, um, no, I don't think there is anything that we should be working on in terms of particular distance because the question is always with walking, what is the quality? Um, it, you know, one sees maps with you know, five minute walking circles drawn on or 10 minute walking circles to get to public transport stops and stations. The, you know, I don't know where that, that kind of distance came from. It doesn't really mean a great deal in everyday terms because I could show you 100 meter walks which are terrifying that nobody would want to do. And I could also show you 10 kilometer walks that you would be very happy to do. Um, now maybe 10, 10 kilometers to get to the station is a little much, but the point that I'm making is if you entice a Gen Y uh, down a street with a coffee, uh, somewhere to stop for coffee, somewhere to, to, to meet friends, somewhere that's easy to get to the bus stop, a park to walk through, uh, other people to interact with on the way, then that journey becomes so seamless and so interesting and so delightful, it could be almost any length. So I, I don't think we need to get too stuck on the idea that there are particular distances that we need to work at. The, the, the question is, make the walk as attractive and interesting and comfortable as possible, and then people will walk longer distances. And I guess from an inter intergenerational perspective, for Gen Ys, they are much more interested in informal seating than formal seating, whereas for um, seniors, they're much more interested in formal seating than informal seating. So if you put granite blocks out there, you'll get bunches of Gen Y sitting on there, you know, using uh, 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 phones and so on and chatting, whereas, you know, So I'm just interested in terms of your work well, now in the US and uh, previously in, in the UK, the, the, the difference between the rural and, well, in, in, in New South Wales, the rural and remote context and uh, more urbanised areas uh, like our major cities. Well, I, I don't honestly know New South Wales as a state uh, well enough to answer that question with any you know, specificity. but. Um, clearly there is a distinction between small towns and large. Many of the examples that I've used have been large cities across the world. Um, and we do have an issue in small towns which often have higher car ownership levels, lower public transport usage, more people driving, and an expectation that you can drive directly to your destination and park right outside. Um, and so for many of those communities, it's actually quite interesting taking them on that journey from cow town to metropolitan focus. Um, that they, they need to change if they want to get people walking more in those places. And part of that's about parking and it's about shopping, but it's also about calming traffic. And in many of them, it's about slowing traffic that comes through on arterial roads which are not controlled by the local government. 
and um, that's an issue which is being taken up by communities across the world that traffic calming on arterial roads mm -hmm. brings hardly any disbenefit to long distance truck traffic but huge benefits to the communities which are often severed <coughs> by that traffic. Um, sport and recreation and park use is, is a key issue as well uh, to make sure that people can access those things easily um, and getting kids to school is, is a key issue in regional communities as well. Uh, we're often the barrier provided by a main road coming through is the principal reason why parents often don't let their, their, their children walk to school. And again, we see the same thing for seniors. They're isolated into pockets on one side of an arterial rather than being able to use the entire urban area. And for them, that may mean not getting to a pharmacy or not getting to friends, and it may mean more housebound futures. So I guess it's, it's more of the same. Uh, but it is tweaking it to a, a, a different set of issues. And, you know, almost certainly the Gen Y arguments don't apply yet to, to regional New South Wales. That, 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 that is a big city issue. Um, but there's a thirst out there. There's a hunger out there for more people to walk. And certainly the, um, the, the ageing issue is going to be one that they have to face into the future. So it's not only a question from our perspective of them needing to do it. There will be a demand from their own population for them to do it too. Uh, there's one question here, and then we'll come to you. So, if you're up first, and then... Okay, Charlotte Stanfield from Transport for New South Wales. Um, from Transport for New South Wales, but a personal question in understanding. Are you seeing overseas um, that schools and universities are actually achieving and setting mode split targets that children and university students must either walk, cycle, or take public transport, and seeing any way financial reward for example, more whiteboards, better uh, sports facilities, etc. So a drive that way to change our young people's behaviour and reduce congestion in the peak for some of the other activities that are occurring. Um, the answer is in two parts, I suppose. Yes, there is a tremendous amount happening. And, and if I restrict myself to um, school-age students rather than university students, because I think they're rather different populations, um, at school age students, I think we're seeing lots and lots of examples of schools and uh, jurisdictions being successful um, in increasing active travel to school. Um, the second answer there is about resourcing, is that no, I don't see a large amount of rewards being given to schools as a result of their uh, more appropriate behaviour. Um, much of that is coming through, uh, through uh, advocacy work, through initiatives from the school, initiatives particularly from health bodies, uh, but they're not always rewarded in terms of resources from, from outside, and that clearly is a gap. Um, there are some exceptions. In the UK, for example, every school must have a school travel plan. Um, otherwise, it does not get government funding. So that's a very key issue. Now, Unfortunately, I don't think the <coughs> legislation says that every school must enact a school travel plan or demonstrate positive results from it, but at least they're forced into the process of having one. And a school travel plan has as its goal reduction of vehicle travel to the school, and like a business plan it will have actions and timelines and goals and measurements and evaluations and so on, um, with the idea of making sure that school has in place a realisation that the school is creating the problem and therefore the school needs to solve the problem. And interestingly, the, the school governors have to sign, the teachers have to sign, the local neighbourhood has to sign, the local council has to sign, and the students at the school have to sign. In other words, it's a collective responsibility to do something about the problem. Um, I can't report on measures on how successful that's been, but I mean there are many, many individual programs like WOW, you know, Walk on Wednesday, the International Walk to School month as well. Uh, Canada has a huge active travel program going. The US spent $600 million a year over the last five years. So, you know, th th there's lots and lots of work out there. Uh, in terms of pinning me down to show exactly what success they've had, I can't give you those numbers, but if you go to Safe Routes to School website, You'll, you'll start to pick those up, I'm sure. Great. So there was a, another question here, and then we'll have time for one more. So first, DLP. Oh, hi, um, my name's David Sleet. I'm with the uh, GPT group, who's a, a private development group. We own a few shopping centres, such as the ones in the large um, picture at the top, and a few more in the new model down below. Um, I'm interested in 
your thoughts on the phenomenon of um, reintroduction of cars into formerly pedestrianised malls and the impact on walkability on, on that? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I think it's fair to say that some of the most desperate shopping places in Australia are in failing pedestrian malls. And it's also fair to say that some of the greatest shopping environments in Australia are in Burke Street, Ann Street, Brisbane, Pitt Street here, etc. So there's nothing wrong with the model. The, it's a question of how it's applied. And it's a question of the retail mix that's in there. And it's a question of uh, having people <coughs> delivered to that space. You know, walkability is wonderful, but you've got to have walkers. Um, so <coughs> applying you know, good quality walkability principles to the wrong place is not necessarily going to you know, magically in, in, increase the number of people walking there. So I, I, I wouldn't be drawn on the idea of whether whole scale pedestrianisation is good or bad. I think that very much is a case of, of local circumstances. Um, I don't think European examples are very hel helpful, but you could go to you know, Germany, for example, and see that every city centre is pedestrianised and it's, you know, they're, they're hugely successful. Um, the Australian model is, is clearly different. But you don't have to go down that route entirely. You don't have to remove cars completely all the time. It could be a flexible street where they're there some of the time, some of the day, some of the evening, some seasons. Um, or increasingly, many communities are actually going for shared streets. Uh, which bring the benefits of all of those things. And uh, these were a Dutch phenomenon to start with. They spread throughout Europe and they're now appearing in, in many other countries as well. And the idea of a shared street is uh, you take away the dominance of the car, you take away the rules that force people to walk on footpaths, up on the curbs, um, relegating them to the side of the street and allowing cars to use the middle and often dominate that space. Take away the footpaths, take away the signs, take away the traffic lights, take away every piece of, of uh, control structure until you've just got an open space that is <coughs> intriguing to most people. And when motorists who are perfectly allowed to drive in there arrive, they say, way, this is a bit of a different space. Clearly the signals are I should behave more differently here. Um, and they will make eye contact and other ways of contacting people on foot and negotiate their way through the space. And the end result is you still keep your car access, if that's what you need, uh, but those who don't really need to drive directly there after a while will say, well, actually, it'd be more sensible for me to park a little way away and then enjoy the walk, because clearly it's a lovely space to walk through. So I guess the answer is, don't be definitive about that. Don't, don't compartmentalize into good and bad simply react to the local circumstances, but certainly think in the direction of sharing the space into the future rather than segregating into walking or, or, or car use. Okay, so we, we're almost at the end of the Q&A time, so we'll have one more question and then we will go to a break. And before we have the final question, I just want to say that these presentations are all being filmed and will be available on the PCAL website um, um, afterwards. So the last question, that's um, you. Thanks, Rodney. Uh, very inspiring. Um, you mentioned um, road safety as a barrier to, uh, <coughs> to walking. I've looked at some statistics about pedestrian safety in Holland and Denmark, and they've come down in terms of the rate of pedestrian crashes absolutely incredibly. Do you know why? That's a very quick answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any, any suggestions? Well, um, I, I think you mentioned the Dutch already in the in the owner of the shared space, and and I think that very much relates to it. Also, uh, I think there is a huge extension of the 30k zones. I'm trying to get my head around and how much and when and where all this precisely happens. Um, th there is no there is no one answer to that. They are doing many many things. Uh, the, the Dutch, of course, do wonderful, wonderful things for cycling. They're not particularly at the forefront of doing things for walking. Uh, but they're part of a kind of a European mindset, I suppose, which has adopted 30 kilometers an hour as a pretty norm for <coughs> residential streets and shopping streets across cities. They are fortunate and they have a culture whereby a vulnerable person involved in a traffic crash is automatically assumed to be innocent, and the non-vulnerable person driving a car is automatically assumed to be guilty, um, and the parties start negotiation over the legal process from that point. So that makes drivers a lot more careful, um, because they know the assumption is that they're going to be 
uh, in, in some difficulty in explaining away what's happened. Um, the speed thing, though, is, is, is key. Um, and uh, what we're seeing now, I think, is spreading across the world. The UK now has a very strong campaign called 20s Plenty, um, which is 20 miles an hour rather than kilometers an hour. And what's interesting is that that started off as a movement around schools and shops and, and residential areas. It's now become, in I think, I think about 12 million people in Britain, a fifth of the population, now live in towns and cities where the entire urban area is 20 miles an hour. And that is a very interesting twist because before the argument was always, well, let's have a 50k, 60k speed limit across the city, but if you want to argue for lower than that in special places, you know, like around schools or residential areas, let's hear the argument. Well, we've now moved on from that. Now the argument is it's going to be 20 miles an hour or 30 kilometers an hour across the whole city, and if you want your street to be faster than that, now come and start the discussion. And that, I think, you know, forces people into thinking more carefully about really whether they want those higher speeds in, in those places. So for, the, the speed issue is key, but there, there's a whole set of other reasons about driver behavior and driver training and so on, which is, which is part of that as well. But uh, we, we do need to attend to the issue of still pedestrians wandering around looking at their handsets and not being as attentive as they might be. All right, well, look, I'm sure you'll agree with me that that was a fantastic session by Dr. Rajiv Chollet. Enjoy with me and thank you.